does. Today we're in chapter 3 here in the book of Philippians, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And so I'll begin reading here at, uh, at verse 1. And uh, I'll read just first verse 1 because we're going to look at all 11 verses, but I want to introduce our, our uh, passage by just looking at verse 1, and then we'll move on into verse 2 until we get to uh, verse 11. Let's begin at verse 1 and read verse 1. Uh, Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Now, Paul begins by introducing final matters. These are the final things that he is going to uh, take up with the uh, Philippians. And I want you to see as he begins, he begins with a call to rejoicing. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. So he begins his final things by calling them to rejoice in the Lord. Now, we have to ask our, ourselves the question, why did he begin with that exhortation? Why does he begin with an exhortation to rejoice in the Lord? Well, they need to remember the source of joy. They need to remember that the joy they have is the result of a fellowship that they have. They have joy because they have fellowship with Jesus Christ. You see, biblical joy is inseparable from our relationship with God. In Psalm 32, verse 1, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That word blessed is, is a word that speaks about being happy. Happy is the one who's forgiven. Happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Happy is the one whose sin is covered. You see, the joy of salvation is a great remedy against false doctrine. The reason is very obvious. False doctrine eventually results in bondage and not joy. False doctrine normally centers on man's activity for God and not God's activity on behalf of man. And because that's true, as a result of that, it's filled with rules and regulations that really center on self-effort. When you get caught up in false doctrine, it's really all that you can do for God. It's really what is emphasized constantly, not what God has done for you, which is the source of all that you do for Him. When you get caught up in false doctrine, it's really all that you can do for Him, all the things that you can do for Him. And so there is no grace, there's no mercy, and there, the result is there's no joy because you're constantly trying to work yourself into a relationship with God. When Paul was writing the Colossians in chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, he said, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines, he says, of men. Why do you get caught up with these do not do these things instead of being free in Jesus Christ? You see, salvation is a work of God. And it's received as a free gift through sincere faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you got saved. It isn't the result of our efforts. It's a result of trusting in what God has done for us. When Paul was writing in Romans 4, he said in verses 4 and 5, When a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. And so joy is the fruit of the Spirit of God. It produces satisfaction within you when you're saved. And joy, as found in the Bible, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. When you look at Galatians chapter 5 and it lists the fruit of the Spirit, he says in verses 22 and 23, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he goes on to say, against such... There's no law. So those who are caught in religious systems that teach self-effort don't have God's joy. They may be great people, by the way. They may be very nice. They may be very caring. They may be very disciplined. They may be very dedicated. But they have no spiritual joy. Bad doctrine ultimately produces stress. And you can see it. You can see it in the faces of these young men who who wheel their 10 speeds up to your house. There's stress in them. You can see it in the faces of those people who are holding those little awake and watchtower magazines or knocking on your door. There's no joy. When they come to the door, they want to fight. They want to argue with you. They want to wrestle spiritual things with you. They want to cause you to come into their side. There's no joy. I can still remember I was just saved. I hadn't been saved for more than two, three weeks. I was a brand new believer in Christ. And you know, I was a freak, you know, I have to be honest with you, I was a hippie, 
and uh, I was home, and I had been taught you need to read the Bible, and so I found myself reading the Bible all the time. And um, there was a knock on the door, and I remember answering the door, and there were these two, uh, two ladies standing at my door. And, and you have to, I, I came walking to the door. I didn't have a shirt on. I had long hair. I looked, you know, I had round granny glasses on, you know. I, I, I looked like I had been drunk for three days, but I, I wasn't. I had been saved. And I remember opening the door and smiling at these women. They, they said, hi, we want to talk to you about Jesus Christ. And I said, great. I was real excited. All right, we can talk about Jesus. I didn't know who they were. And so they got kind of freaky with me because they looked at me and they go, oh, you know. And I said, no, let's talk about Jesus. I, I, I just received the Lord. I just got saved. And I'm all excited about it. And, and well, they're Je Jehovah's Witnesses, you know. And, and Jehovah's Witnesses don't have joy because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't even believe in a Holy Spirit. They think the Spirit of God is an energy. It's a force from God. It's not a person. So they don't have the joy of the Spirit. They don't have the fruit of the Spirit. They're caught up knocking on doors and arguing with people. That's what they do. And so when they stood there talking to some wild-eyed Jesus freak kid who didn't know anything other than, you know what, I was, I was an, an alcoholic, I was a druggie, you know, but now I'm safe. They didn't know what to do with me. They didn't know how to talk to me. And I remember them starting an argument, trying to start an argument. What do I know? I'm three weeks old in the Lord. What do I know? All I know is that I, I don't believe what you're saying is true. And they're not smiling, so they don't have something that I have. And as I'm looking at them, you know, I began to talk to them and shared with them. And I said, listen, I don't know if what you're saying is true or not. I really don't. I said, I'm, I'm new at this. I said, but I, I got to tell you, you don't have anything to offer me. You don't have anything to offer me. What I have is from the Lord. I remember as a young believer speaking to some Mormon young men. And, and, and once again, we were discussing spiritual things. And, and they, they wanted me to become a Mormon. And, and I looked at them and I said, let me ask you. What do you have that I need? What is it that you're coming to my door to offer me that I don't already have in Jesus Christ? What do you have that I don't have already? And they looked at me and they said, the priesthood. I'll never forget this. They said, we have the priesthood. And I looked at them and I said, I've got the high priest, Jesus Christ, who ever lives to make intercession for me. You don't have anything that I need. I've got all that I need in Jesus Christ. Listen, when you get caught up in Jesus Christ and you have the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when people come and try and, and rip you up, it's always to get you to stand on a street corner with an awake or to ride your 10 speed somewhere or do something very difficult. It always is something that's going to steal joy, not produce it. The Holy Spirit gives you joy. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. The joy that you have is not happiness. Happiness is really a word that's derived from the word happenings. It speaks of circumstances. So if my circumstances are good, if I've got a job, if I've got money in my pocket, if my kids are doing well, if my wife is faithful, then I'm happy. My circumstances dictate that. But what happens if, if those things aren't true in my life? What happens if I lost my job or if I'm having family problems? I can still have the joy of the Lord. I can still have that because that is not connected to what's going on around me. That comes from heaven itself. And because I have a relationship with God, I know that he's going to see me through. And I can rejoice in the Lord because I know he's on my side. And so there are people who have religious systems that, that actually bring them into bondage. Talk to the person who believes that God guarantees healing. All you need to have is faith and pray in faith. And, and talk to that person when they're not healed, when they pray. And see what you hear. I've had conversations with people who believe that. Who believe that God automatically guarantees healing simply because I hold on by faith. And when they're not healed, they blame themselves and they have no joy. Because this doctrine has stolen the joy from them. And so bad doctrine will ensnare you. That's why in verse 1 here in chapter 3, that's why Paul says, My brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Bad doctrine produces stress, and Jesus Christ sets you free. In Galatians 5, 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of bondage. So Jesus sets us free. He gives us joy. He breaks the yoke of bondage in our lives, and we have the joy of salvation. That's why in John 15, 11, he said, These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. 
Think about this. The Apostle Paul has been put in a jail cell. And as he and Silas are there in this jail in, in Philippi, they're singing songs to the Lord at midnight. Now, they could have been complaining and very angry because they'd been mistreated, they'd been injured. And there they are, though, singing songs to the Lord. And, and the jailer ultimately begins a conversation. And, and what he does, it's, it's recorded in Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 34, as he, pre, he brought them out and he asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied to him, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved in your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and, and washed their wounds. And immediately he and his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And it goes on to say, and he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. And so when the Lord does a work, there's a joy that you have. And, and that's what Paul is speaking about. He's saying, I'm warning you, and you're going to see this in a moment. I'm warning you against false teachers because false teachers will steal the joy of your salvation. They'll steal it from you. So he says, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but he says, but for you, it is safe. It's not difficult for me to repeat lessons that you should have learned or could have learned in the past. But the fact is, is we normally need lessons to be repeated for emphasis. And so he has no problem repeating things that he's already said to them. You stay in this church long enough, and I'm going to repeat several things to you. You're going to know them by heart. That's the way I teach. I repeat things. I figure if I keep repeating certain things, we'll all get it. See, it took me about a year to know that when my mom said, David, she was talking to me. It took about a year for me to recognize that that's my name. And repetition will teach. Repetition will teach you. All you need to do is repeat certain basic things, and it eventually gets ground into us. And the Lord Jesus Christ used the method of repetition. He often repeated uh, the same lesson, and you'll see this uh, several times in Scripture. For example, when you read concerning the cleansing of the temple, be aware of the fact and remember that when Jesus cleansed the temple, he actually did it twice. Sometimes we think that, that Jesus only did it the one time. No, he cleansed the temple twice. He cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry, as is recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 2. That was the beginning of his ministry. But then at the conclusion of his ministry, he once again went in and cleansed the temple, as is recorded in Matthew 21. When Jesus was speaking to his disciples concerning the resurrection, he didn't speak to them only once concerning it. He spoke concerning his, re his resurrection several times. He would speak to them concerning the fact he was to be betrayed. He spoke concerning the fact that he was going to die, that he was going to be buried, that he was going to be raised again from the dead. He said it several times. When you study it, once again, at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 2, he spoke about his resurrection. Destroy this temple. In three days, he said, I will raise it up. He spoke concerning the temple of his body, John tells us. But at the end, when he's ministering to his disciples, he speaks concerning it in Matthew chapter 16, in Matthew chapter 17, again in Matthew chapter 20. He repeated over and over and over again the single lesson of his resurrection. When Jesus fed the 5,000, that wasn't the only time that he, he multiplied uh, food for, for hungry people. He fed the 5,000, as is recorded in Matthew 14, but then he followed up with the feeding of the 4,000 found in Matthew chapter 15. Now, why did he do that? Were they so hungry they had, had to eat twice? Well, in Matthew 16, after Jesus had, had done these miracles, both the feeding of the five and then the feeding of the four, uh, he had a, a lesson that he had to give to his disciples. It's, it's found in Matthew 16, verses 9 and 10, when he spoke to them and he said it this way. He said, do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? He said, haven't you learned the lesson? I gave you a marvelous lesson, something that should have stayed in your heart forever. I mean, just the thought of him feeding 5,000. And that, the Bible says, was 5,000 men, not including women and children. Many commentators say that the number was 12 to 15,000 who actually were fed 
when he fed the 5,000. All you need to do is, is uh, add children and wives, and you'll see that it was an incredible number beyond that 5,000 and beyond that four. And yet, they didn't remember. So don't feel discouraged when you go through the same lesson more than once. Don't feel discouraged. You know what? Learn the lesson. And sometimes it takes time. Some lessons take time. I've discovered some lessons I am learning over and over and over again. I suspect that the day I finally really do learn it is when I die. I'll die, and then I'll say, oh, I get it. Yeah, you got it. Finally, bang, you're dead. <laughs> That's how it's going to be. Because some lessons you hear over and over again. How many times does the Lord have to say, forgive somebody until you forgive them? How many times does God have to say, love that person until you love them? I mean, how many lessons has the Lord tried to repeat over and over and over again? And we say, oh, I get it this time, Lord. I got it solid. I know. And then, oh, man, I hate. And he says again, when are you going to let it go? But I did, Lord, for 20 minutes. <laughs> there are so many lessons that I've had to learn over and over again. That's why... Um, that's why I try not to say I've learned that lesson. I like to say, I've tried to make a habit of saying, I'm learning that lesson. I'm learning that lesson through repetition. Various degrees, but I'm learning the same basic lessons. And it always, by the way, always boils down to, to one thing. It always does. If the Lord God says that the royal law is fulfilled in one word, that you love your neighbor as yourself. What is the great commandment? Love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. And so it all hinges on me learning to love God with everything and love people. And so, like John said, how can you say you love God whom you have not seen and hate your brother whom you have seen? In other words, if you say you love the invisible, that's easy to say. But loving the invisible is demonstrated by loving the visible. So if you really love God, you're going to learn to love other people. And so if I'm one of these that says, you know, I love the Lord. It's people I can't stand. I probably haven't learned the lesson of love yet. And so the Lord would have us learn some basic things. And that's why repetition is necessary. It's necessary because emphasis is established and truth is clarified. It's obvious that God believes in repetition. All we need to do is think about how many gospels we have. We have four gospels. We have three that are called the synoptic gospels because they basically cover the same information. And then we have John's gospel, the fourth gospel. And God gave to us four witnesses to the same facts, basically. And so we have witnesses that are given to us so that we can learn. In Romans chapter 15, verse 15, Paul said, I've written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave to me to remind you. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, the apostle says, My brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into eternal, the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. You're going to hear, the apostle said, over and over again, the same essentials, the same basic things. Never get to the point where you really believe you've got it all down, because you don't, because you don't. I get advice sometimes from people about raising kids, they, you know, they want to teach me how to raise children. And I have found that some of the most insistent and best teachers are the ones who've never had any. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm not kidding. The most insistent and best are the ones who've never had one. I was sharing with somebody just recently. I said, you know, and we were talking on that subject, and I said, you know, it's one thing to have a small child and to be so certain that you're going to raise that child perfectly, so certain that you can give other people lessons concerning that. It's another thing when that child turns 13. It's another thing when they turn 18. 
It's another thing when they turn 21. It's another thing when they turn 30. So you begin to learn lessons over the years, lessons that you didn't know at the beginning. And some of the things that you believed are reinforced. Some of the things that you so firmly believed in, you discover were inaccurate. That's how it works. But if it's all done with the love of Jesus Christ and a hope to understand and to do the best that you can, at the end, you can stand before the Lord saying, I did the best that I could with the tools that I had. But you have to learn over time. And some things the Lord teaches you in different stages. Some things he gives you different degrees concerning. And you gain greater insights over time. When it comes to spiritual things, the Lord has a tendency of, of giving to us the same basic lessons over and over again because it's the basic things that we do that help us to live for him in the best of ways. So he says, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it's safe. He goes on to say, beware of dogs. Every mailman knows that scripture. <laughs> beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Now what Paul is about to repeat for their safety relates to false teachers. False teachers who are attempting to infiltrate the church. And Paul is making it clear that these false teachers will ultimately steal their joy. And that's why he's warning them. Now notice how he refers to them. He calls them dogs. When he says, beware of dogs, they're like dogs because they're nipping at his heels. They, they would follow Paul around and they would tear apart his words and they would call into question his ministry. That word dog there is a contemptuous name. Uh, that uh, word refers to a scavenger a snapping, vicious mongrel. And he's using that word in a derogatory sense because that's what these people were. They would follow him around when he ministered in order that they might try to undermine the things that he's doing. Do dogs exist like that today? Absolutely. Yes. Yes, they do. Go to the Harvest Crusade and roll in. And so often there have been people standing there with placards who call Greg Laurie a false prophet. If it was Rawl, it would apply. But it's Greg, it doesn't. <laughs> I love Rawl, I tease him, you know that, right? Don't tell him what I said. No, but think about it. You've probably seen it if you've gone to Harvest. You roll in, there's somebody there, Greg Laurie is a false prophet. They, they do it all the time. They post things about Greg. They're, they're vicious. They're dogs. I have to be honest with you. That's what Paul's talking about. People who follow you around, nipping at your heels, undermining the things that you're doing for Jesus Christ. These that he's referring to in context are false prophets, are deceivers. But you can have that attitude, even as someone who professes Christ, when you want to undermine the things that God wants to do. And so that was a contemptuous name. He calls them evil workers. Now the reason he calls them evil workers is because their work is evil. In other words, they're destructive. They're destructive against the things of God. What they're doing is they're turning the church away from Jesus Christ. And, and as such, that's an evil work against the Lord. He calls them the mutilation. Now, when he refers to them as a mutilation, these are mutilators who glory in legalism. Now, when he refers to them in that way, undoubtedly he's speaking about men who are saying that for you to have a relationship with God, you have to come under the law of Moses. Mutilators of the flesh is another way of speaking about those who are insisting that Gentiles receive circumcision. You need to remember that the Jews had circumcision as an outer emblem of a covenantal relationship that they had with God. Circumcision began with Abraham. Moses actually had circumcision with his sons, and it was brought into the law. And so during the time of Christ, there were some who were adding to the grace of God the law of Moses. So they were saying, if you're going to understand grace at its depth, you have to understand by living under the law, the things of the law. And so they would say to the Gentiles, you need to receive physical circumcision. But Paul in Galatians 5 verse 6 said, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. 
Abraham was counted righteous before God before he was circumcised. And so it's always been faith. It's always been the God's mercy through grace that has caused us to have a relationship with God. And that's the point that he's making here. Notice verse 3. He says, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. True circumcision is not the cutting of flesh from a body. True circumcision is a pure heart by faith in Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah 4, verse 4, it says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you men of Judah and people of Jerusalem, or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you've done. Burn with no one to quench it. So he said, Circumcise yourselves, circumcise your hearts. True circumcision is an attitude of the heart. The Gentile did not have to yield to that Jewish rite. These individuals are saying you do, but Paul is saying no. We are the circumcision who worship God, he says, in the spirit. When he says we worship God in the spirit, worship in this case implies service to the Lord. We worship him and serve him. John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus said the hour comes and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We are the circumcision. We worship God in the spirit. The Holy Spirit has come upon us. The Holy Spirit has empowered us. The Holy Spirit has sealed us. The Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit gifts us. We are filled with his spirit and we live in his spirit and we worship God in spirit and in truth. He also speaks about rejoicing in Christ Jesus. The reason I rejoice in Jesus Christ is because of the work of redemption. Jesus saved me and that work has caused me to have great joy. It's like again in Psalm 32 verse 2, it says, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And you rejoice in that with that knowledge that your sins have been completely and forever washed away by the Lord Jesus Christ's blood. Not by your works, but by his grace and his mercy. And, and they've been cast away from you. They're, they're dropped into the deepest part of the sea, never to be brought back to mind. The Lord has made a choice to not bring them back and to speak concerning them again. The Lord made that choice to allow you and me to live 100% free in Christ. And that wasn't a work that I did. It was a receiving by faith of his grace, a promise he made that transforms a life. So we rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can wake up in the morning, and even if things aren't going well on the outside, you can wake up in the morning and say, but I know God is on my side. I know that the Lord is with me. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I can trust him, and I will. I'll hold fast to him. And then the Lord brings you through, and you rejoice in him. And then he says, and we have no confidence in the flesh. We don't put confidence in observing rules and regulations like the law. What we do is we trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And we don't lean on our own, own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge him. He directs our path. And we understand those things. We have no confidence in the flesh. But now, he speaks concerning why he would be able to have great confidence if he trusted in the flesh. Notice what he says in verse 4. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. But indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, 
if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The power of a testimony. I was mentioning in the morning services today that sometimes evangelism can rely on personal testimony. I think that teaching ought to include, on occasion, obviously, the sifting of the Word of God through a person's life for illustration purposes. In other words, you can use illustrations as you communicate the gospel because not only is it applicable to those who lived 2,000 years ago, it's applicable now. God does work in our life. And you can, you can say, this is how the Lord has worked in my life, and I think that's, that's powerful and, and that's proper. You can do that. But sometimes evangelism seems to center on personal stories, experiences, and emotions. And unfortunately, that really isn't biblical evangelism so much as simply using emotional hooks to try and convince people of a certain perspective. It's the Word of God that we need to present to people, the Word of God rightly divided, and illustrations that are found in Scripture. Paul used his testimony not to enhance his reputation before people, but to illustrate the grace of God. The reason he uses his testimony is to use himself as an example of what he was without Christ and what he has become in Christ. And so he uses that as a contrast in order to help people to see how good God is and how bad man is without God. And that's why he uses this powerful testimony. That's why he says in verse 4, I also might have confidence in the flesh. And he makes it clear, if anyone thinks that he should have confidence, I'm more. And that's why he goes through the things that he's gone through. He's really pointing out here, if you took notes, you could say this. He says, he's basically saying, I was a thoroughly Jewish man. Thoroughly Jewish. Because he's already discussing the fact that some are calling people under the law, the mutilation. And so what he's trying to say here is, listen, I was under Jewish law, and I can speak in that way. I can speak as one who understands that. Because I was there. And that's what he's basically doing. And he begins to just give his pedigree. Circumcised the eighth day. When he says that, that's another way of saying from, from infancy, I was under the law. Because according to uh, Leviticus 12, the, uh, the male child is to be circumcised on the eighth day. That's when they receive circumcision. Because his father was a Pharisee, his father made sure that he followed the law even from infancy. So he's saying that. He's saying, I followed the commands to the letter even from being a baby. He says in verse 5, of the stock of Israel. In other words, I am Jewish born. I am not a Gentile who converted, but I was born Jewish. He says, of the tribe of Benjamin. This is the tribe that remained faithful when the other tribes split. The first king of Israel came out of Benjamin. And Gentiles were brought into the nation of Israel through conversion, he's saying, but, I don't, but they don't have a tribal affiliation. I can tell you my tribe, it was Benjamin. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, that's something that I think many of us can understand. He's saying, I'm a pure Hebrew stock. Not only uh, do I speak Hebrew, but culturally, I'm a Hebrew. A Hebrew of Hebrews. I am not only one who can say my lineage is from Israel, and I can point back, but my culture is Israel. Now, some people would understand that better than others, to be honest with you. We have Americans, we call them hyphenated Americans. Irish American, Italian American, African American, Mexican American. We're hyphenated Americans. We have a way of speaking of our ethnicity, but we also are aware of uh, our, where we came from in terms of what, what nations may be represented by, by, our, uh, by our stock. I'm a Mexican-American, but to a Mexican, I'm an American. Just take that word Mexican out. You're an American because that's how they see me, and, and I understand that. Because though I am Mexican-American, culturally, I'm an American. That is my culture. Paul is saying, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's saying, I was born into a tribe. I have tribal affiliation. I speak Hebrew, and my culture is Hebrew. Now, when you look back in the book of Acts, 
the first argument that you find in the church is when the Greek speaking, the Hellenistic Jews were being neglected in, in the um, dispensing of finances for, uh, you know, that were put aside for, for their needs. Uh, and the Hebrew speaking and cultural Hebrew uh, speaking uh, believers were neglecting the Gentiles. And that's when you found your first division in, in the New Testament. It was over culture. It was over how people were being treated because of those things. And so Paul is basically saying, listen, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I am Jewish in culture and I am Jewish in language. And that makes me, he's saying, in terms of pedigree, somebody that can look all the way back to the nation of Israel and identify with all that Israel is. When he speaks of himself as being a Pharisee, the Pharisee was the strictest branch of the Jewish religion. When he speaks in verse 6 concerning zeal, he says, I persecuted the church. In other words, I wasn't a lukewarm Pharisee. I hated Christ. And I hated Christians with all of my heart. He says, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless. In other words, I kept the law to its letter. Now, I need to add this real quickly. Was Paul saying that I was righteous before God by the law of Moses? And the answer is no. He says to the Galatians, no one is justified before God by law because they shall live by faith, Galatians 3.11. In Galatians 2.21, he said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness came by the law, Christ died in vain. And so he's not saying I was justified by the law. What he's saying is I, carry, I carefully followed out the outward observance of the law and was blameless in that. I carefully observed the Sabbath. I lived under dietary law. I lived under the rituals. But these advantages didn't bring me closer to God. What they were were excess baggage on a sinking ship, ultimately. That's what he says in verse 7, when he says, What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss. Now, it's interesting how he, how he says this, because I want you to notice this. He uses speech commonly found in the marketplace. He's speaking about gain and loss, or profit and loss. My former prophets were, la were lost in comparison to the incredible gain. What I had was useless. What I gained was everything. What I had didn't do me a, a bit of good. It, it, it did me good only in the eyes of man. If you saw me, you saw me as a zealous Pharisee. And, and people would look at me and say, what a good man, what a righteous man, what a zealous man. So in the eyes of man, I was fine. But in the eyes of God, I was lost. I was a sinner. I breathed out threatenings to those who, who believed in Messiah. I persecuted them to the death. I wasn't a righteous man. I thought it was, but I wasn't. And what I've gained is worth everything that I've let go. Notice he says, indeed, in verse 8, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. That word rubbish is is a strong word. It's really dung. It's refuse. I see them as being absolutely valueless, like waste products. That's what they are to me. That's a strong word that he's given there. Salvation through Jesus Christ. Righteousness through Jesus Christ is great gain. In Mark 8, 36 and 37, the question is asked, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, we sell our souls cheaply. We do. We sell our souls cheaply. We don't see the value of it. We sell them cheaply. We sell them for re relationships. You know, 
we, we sell them for alcohol, we sell them for drugs, we sell them for a little money. We, we sell them, our soul is, to most people, is very cheap. It, it, it has no value. But on the other hand, to God, your soul is extremely value, valuable. It, it was so valuable that he gave his son. It is so valuable that he allowed his son to be, to be tortured, to be placed on a cross, to be mocked, and to die. That's how much value he put on your soul, on my soul. But the value I put on it is, it's no big deal. I'll sell it for a drink. I'll sell it for a joint. I'll sell it for a car. It doesn't really matter. It, 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 it has no value to me. Paul said those things that I one time had that, that others looked at as being valuable, he said they're really rubbish, they're really dung, they're really useless, they really don't have value. He says the excellence that I have now in Jesus Christ is worth everything and therefore I am willing to yield up all the other things that I at one time thought were advantageous just for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. The things that other people looked at Paul and, and you need to remember that he, when he speaks in another place concerning his, his testimony, he, he was looked at as being the up and coming rabbi. He, he sat under the greatest teacher, a man by the name of Gamaliel, and he speaks concerning that, that Gamaliel was his teacher, his instructor, and this was the man who was a premier instructor. And Paul could point and say, listen, when it comes to being mentored, when it comes to being trained up in the things of Judaism, he said, I sat under the wisest teacher, the most respected teacher of our time, a man by the name of Gamaliel. He said, but you want to know something? All the things that I learned, I've, I've come to realize if they didn't bring me to Christ, if they were not useful in my walk with Jesus Christ, then they had no real value to them. The things that have value to me are the things that make me better in my walk with Jesus Christ. So I'm willing to let those things go because they have no profit to me. There's no gain in them in order that I might have that which is excellent and has eternal value, which is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why he says, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. In verse 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the, the righteousness which is from God by faith. I have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 10 and says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Uh, something that stands out, and I'm going to close with a few things here in verse 10, but something that stands out, I want you to see verse 10, how he says that I may know him. That I may know him. He doesn't say that I may know things about him. That I may know him. What are you saying, Paul? Listen, in, in the years that I've walked with the Lord, I've met a lot of people who have interesting concepts of fellowship with God. And some of the more interesting ones that I've encountered are the ones who think that knowledge is equal to maturity. The more that they gain in terms of understanding, in terms of scripture memorization, or perhaps reading certain books, and they equate that with being mature in Christ. I remember a guy who was at, in our church at one time who came to see me. He wanted to show me a picture of his library. And he brought it, and he said, I just want you to see this. And it was him sitting down with all of his books around him. And I thought that, I thought that was interesting. I said, Rawl, it's nice that you can read, but why do you have to show me your books? No, there was this, it was kind of like, you know, I want you to see that I'm well read. And I don't know what you guys are like. And let me, I'll just, once again, I said Sunday nights, I'm a little more open than normal, so I'll be open for a moment. I don't know what you're like. I, you know, I don't know what, what you're impressed with. I don't know what you get impressed by. Only you and the Lord know. But I'll tell you something about myself, as uninteresting as this may be to you. Knowledge doesn't impress me. It, it just never has. I, I've sat under 
professors with multiple degrees. They have forgotten things I'll never learn in a lifetime. I'm not impressed with that. I'm just not. I don't get impressed with brilliance. I just don't. You know what impresses me? Humility. What impresses me is love. What impresses me is kindness. What impresses me is generosity, tenderness, things that I don't have, things that I want. You know, anybody can sit down and study and study and study and get a degree. I'm not, it's not that that's not a good thing. It's not that it's a bad thing. It's just one of those things that, that if you want it, get it. If you don't, doesn't matter. Anybody can study and anybody can work hard. Most anybody can. And, and most people can get a degree, sometimes advanced degrees. And, and I think, you know, if the Lord called you to that and that's something that you pursue and you do it well, that's the path God has for you. God bless you as you take that path. And, and, I, and I, I, I like the discipline that is required to receive those degrees. But if you're not kind, if you're not loving, if you're not caring, if you have no compassion, I'm not impressed. Love is something I want. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so I'm impressed with someone who loves people. I'm impressed with somebody who serves. I'm impressed with somebody who cares. I'm impressed with somebody who weeps over the loss. I'm impressed with, with people who have sensitivity in their heart. You know, in my life, you know, I, I've, I've, I've known some very, you know, athletic men. I've known powerful men. And, and, and I say to myself, you know, that's wonderful that you can run so fast and jump so high. And that's all good. I mean, that's great. But the bottom line is, when you're 70 years old and you can hardly remember how fast you used to run, and you can't even jump off the chair anymore, I'm not impressed. I'm just not. You know what I'm saying? Or if you have to draw me into your house and show me your library, all these books that you read, but you don't remember what you read, but there they are. I know I used to know what's in those. I'm not impressed by that. But if you're kind, if you're loving, if you're gracious, if you love Jesus Christ, if you care about souls, you impress me. You impress me. Because those are qualities. It's interesting, when you look at the, the um, requirements of leadership in a church, we're looking at this on, on Wednesday, and you can see this in Titus 1 as well as in 1 Timothy chapter 3. When you look at the qualities, 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives to you 16 or 17 qualities of a leader. But only one of those qualities includes a gifting where he says the bishop is to be able to teach. He says the elder or the pastor teacher is to be able to teach, apt to teach is what it says. So all of the qualifications for leadership, 16 or 17 qualifications for leadership, read it yourself, 1 Timothy chapter 3. There's only one that you could even speak of as being a spiritual gift, and that is apt to teach. And even that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a pulpit teacher. It means that they know the doctrine well enough to explain doctrine to those who might ask. And so, out of all of those qualities that Paul lists, if you're going to look for somebody to lead a church, they're character traits. Loving your wife not having a bad temper, not being given to alcohol, not being arrogant and belligerent. These are all character traits, character traits. Why? Because a bad character undermines the gospel of Jesus Christ that proclaims a transformed life. Yes, we need to know doctrine, of course, but Paul makes it very clear that I want to know him. I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to know him. I want to be conformed to him. I want to be part of the fellowship of his suffering. I want a depth of, of fellowship with God. That's what he's saying. I want fellowship with him. He says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. In other words, I, I desire the living power of God to be resonant in me. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be identified with Jesus. And I realize that that's going to lead me down a path that is going to cost me. But that's fine with me. He says, I want to be conformed to his death. 
In other words, I want to live what is called the crucified life. I, I want to live a life that is dead to self, but alive to God. And he says, finally, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's his humility, not doubt. He's saying, I identify with Jesus in all of this. I have no fleshly confidence that I will be raised in glory. I have confidence in Christ that I will be raised in glory. And so for me, he's saying, the thing that matters most is being conformed into his image and to live in such a way that I bring glory to God and I know him. That's the key, guys. Not knowing things about him, but knowing him. For me, he says, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Because I want to have a relationship with him. That's Christianity. It's not a religion. It's a relationship.